the very bottom of the world, there's a cheerless land where the long night is 125 degrees below zero, and murderous winds howl at 200 miles an hour across a desert as desolate as the moon. This is Antarctica, the seventh continent, five and a half million square miles of nothing but rock, ice, and drifting snow. No animal lives on the land, no tree, nothing green. Only men in the awful cold. The only source of heat, the fuel they could bring with them. spacecraft, man can see the roundness of the Earth. His eyes can trace its lakes and oceans and the shape of the green lands of its continents. From that far out point, in sharp contrast to the greens and blues of land and water, he can note the stark whiteness of the ice-capped polar regions. To a spaceman, the top and bottom of the Earth look much alike. But a closer look shows the Arctic, the North Polar region, to be an ocean surrounded by land. Melt the ice with the North Pole and you have melted ice, water. On the other hand, Antarctica, the South Polar region, is land, a continent, a continent twice as big as the United States. Remove the ice from the bottom of the world and there remains a large continental land area. Above 60 degrees north latitude, about a million people and many land animals live. There are forests, and lumbering, mining, and fishing industries. But below 60 degrees south latitude, until a few years ago, there was not a single human being. Nothing grew, and there was no land creature bigger than a bug. The Antarctic, exposed to fierce winds, is surrounded by ice most of the year. Summer comes along in October, and the sun shines, or tries to, 24 hours a day for the next five months or so. It's the coldest place on Earth. So cold that 95% of all the ice in the world is here. The weak sun has little effect on the ice, which is piled up for centuries. If we melted this ice, all the seven seas would rise 200 feet. The seaports of the world would be drowned. The Antarctic continent itself, with the awful weight of ice removed, would rise 700 feet. The humidity is as low as the temperature. Rain is almost unheard of. And the raging blizzards are much like desert sandstorms, blowing old snow with tremendous force. Of course, on occasion, it actually snows. But nevertheless, the Antarctic is really as dry as the Sahara Desert. Why is it that man fights vicious elements to live here? Why? Because Antarctica is a scientific laboratory and, ever curious to know, man is here on the forbidding seventh continent to ask questions. But to learn, he must first survive. Until recently, the chief way to survive was by shipping millions of gallons of petroleum fuel thousands of miles. Oil provided heat. Oil generated electricity for light. Oil furnished power for communications and scientific equipment until other scientists and engineers produced a more convenient source of heat and power. On that day, the Atomic Age and the Ice Age met. Antarctica has been here, buried under ice, we do not know. It was not discovered until 1820. No one spent a winter here until 1899. As late as 1951, almost two-thirds of the continent was still unexplored. The trackless wasteland was crossed and recrossed by questing men, and thus man's knowledge of an unknown part of his world was greatly increased. But 
science and man's desire to know made great strides during the International Geophysical Year, the IGY of 1957-58. Following the IGY, an international treaty was drawn up by member nations of the IGY, a treaty formally recognizing that it is in the interest of all mankind that Antarctica shall continue forever to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. And so representatives of Russia, the United States, and 10 other nations fixed their signatures to a treaty that's an inspiring example of what can be done by nations when they truly pursue peace. Thus, the forbidding ice of this once mysterious land became dotted with the outposts of scientific research. Argentina, Belgium, Chile, Norway, and the United Kingdom have stations on the Palmer Peninsula. Along the coast, we find France, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Russia has four bases, three inland and one on the coast. The United States maintains five stations all year round. Pole Station is at the geographic South Pole. New Bird Station in the heart of Marie Birdland. The third is Hallett, a station jointly operated by scientists of New Zealand and the United States. Eight's Station is located in the Ellsworth Land. And finally, there is McMurdo Station, largest and busiest of the five. McMurdo, home to more than 200 men in the sunless Antarctic winter, is the center of scientific investigation and the main support base for all the American stations. Planes of all sizes and many nations operate in and out of McMurdo's Williams Field, some three and a half miles offshore, on ice that once a year or so breaks up and goes to sea. These Russian scientists have landed for an overnight stay at McMurdo en route to their station farther inland. Some 200 American scientists from more than 25 universities, foundations, and government agencies are putting Antarctica through a microscopic examination. They're training on it the mental lenses of biology, cartography, geology, glaciology, gravitology, meteorology, seismology, and upper atmosphere physics. At McMurdo, the Ross Ice Shelf, about the size of Spain, is the perfect laboratory for a glaciologist to study and record the growth, movement, and decay of polar ice. And the Antarctic is a tremendous outdoor laboratory for virgin biological research. What does live here? How have the native organisms adapted themselves to survive the coldest cold on Earth? What is the relationship between flora and fauna here and plants and animals on neighboring continents? Research in the Antarctica has become highly systematized. Bacteria, for example, is studied by two universities. Ohio State devotes its work to examining bacteria in the soil, while a second team of researchers from the University of California is studying bacteria from cold freshwater ponds and warm saltwater lakes. The gate-legged sea spider and his relatives are the subjects of special attention from the University of the Pacific. And the Bernice Bishop Museum of Honolulu is conducting insect study. This friendly fellow was dredged up from some 2,000 feet under the ice flows by scientists of Stanford University. Stanford is now in its third year of studies in marine animals in the McMurdo area. For it is a paradox that the Antarctic is the most lifeless land on Earth, but the Antarctic Ocean abounds with life. And thar she blows, the cry of the whaler sounds in the cold waters, home of the blue whale, the most magnificent and awesome creature on the Earth. Yankee ship has found a fortune here, taking whales that have been known to reach more than 90 feet long, weighing 160 tons.
whales in the Antarctic. Some are hunted, and others, like the killer whale, are hunters. The killer whale is a kind of a porpoise, far removed from his friendly cousins at marine land. As much as 30 feet long, the killer is said to be the world's most savage animal. Seals are quite common, both the dangerous leopard and the gentle Weddell seal. The Weddell seal lumbers in awkward fashion across the ice, apparently unafraid of humans. He likes to poke his nose into things here and there, and frequently gets in everyone's way. The skuas, often called the eagle of the Antarctic, is also a common sight. It lives on fish, topped off with an occasional penguin egg, or baby penguin. And then, of course, there's the real native of the land at the bottom of the world, everybody's favorite. There are 17 different species of penguin in the world. All are well-dressed. But only two, the Emperor and the Adelie, live in the deep Antarctic. The Emperor grows almost four feet tall and has the dignity proper to his height. But little Shorty, the pin-size Adelie, is only a foot and a half high. Well, he is a tremendous swimmer. Naturalists call him an aquatic bird. friends on land, you know they belong to the sea. Scientists are continuing year-round studies of the odd behavior of gravity at the magnetic pole, a phenomenon which has long been observed. This will help us to find out whether the ice cap is shrinking or growing, whether the sea level is rising or falling. Physicists are also studying the polar upper atmosphere, particularly the aurora australis, air glow, cosmic radiation, sunspots, and other atmospheric disturbances. Their findings seem almost certain to be valuable in space exploration. of the sea, as well as space, are probed by scientists, for the Antarctic is the only ocean that extends around the Earth, flowing into the three major oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian. The weather of the southern hemisphere originates in Antarctica. If we want to learn something about that weather, this is the place to begin. But at first glance, the job seems impossible. Long-range forecasts require a chain of weather stations which cover the continent. These must be manned, supplied, and kept up through the long winter night. Today we have only a handful of men and stations to do the job. But to these, we have added an automatic nuclear-powered weather station. This station uses a radioisotope-fueled generator, SNAP-7C, designed and built by the Martin Company's nuclear division as its power supply. It is untended, runs for years without upkeep, and broadcasts regular weather reports every six hours. A similar nuclear-powered station has been broadcasting from the Arctic Circle since August of 1961. Cartographers are engaged in making accurate maps essential for useful exploration of the continent. Their electronic equipment on the ground refines earlier aerial maps, sometimes literally moving mountains.
seismologists are recording earth tremors obtained in Antarctica. The seismologic information transmitted daily to Washington is of value in the worldwide program of earthquake reporting and study. Geologists of the University of Minnesota are studying one of the largest mountain chains on Earth, measuring, examining, detecting rock differences. Geological information about the Antarctic has been collected for 50 years, but it's still very broad and general. A great deal more study is essential, even though seven million cubic miles of ice pose a bit of a problem when it comes to measuring the land beneath. The daily achievements of science here are difficult to weigh, and the work of a week or even a month is not likely to shake the world. It may be years before there is much practical application of results, and only after hundreds and thousands of observations and measurements are made, checked, and evaluated. Some 27 tons of American scientific records were shipped from Antarctica during the International Geophysical Year. The United States Navy has the responsibility of planning and operating the complex support program that makes the American scientific activity possible. Given the code name, Operation Deep Freeze, the Navy directs this vital mission, working with elements of the Air Force, the Army, and the Coast Guard. Of course, the Marine Corps and Navy Seabees are actively engaged too. Involved each year are a dozen ships, thousands of men, three dozen aircraft, and transportation of tons upon tons of equipment and supplies. For like a man in space, each scientist in Antarctica must be backed up by many, many other people. Without the supplies brought in by cargo vessels, Without the tanker's load of fuel for heating, for electric generation, and for snow melters and airplanes. Without icebreakers to smash a watery path through six foot thick ice. Without the Navy's C-130 Hercules, R-4D, and R-7V. Without the Air Force's C-124 Globemaster to fly personnel and express cargo the 2,200 long miles from New Zealand and into the interior. Without all of this Navy-directed support, Antarctica would return to what it was, an icy, lifeless, empty desert. And there would be no McMurdo, the town we have come to think of as the New York of the Deep South, the Deep Freeze South. Aside from the weather that never really is pleasant, McMurdo tries to be like any other town. We have our church with well-attended services. The neighborhood banker is friendly and conservative as a banker should be. We have our hospital with dentists and doctors. Everything any other town has, except mothers, wives, and sweethearts. So we've learned, like the boys marooned in the South Pacific, there's nothing like a dame. We have other problems too. Heating our homes, for instance. Heating oil must be shipped in through the ice at great expense. And the danger of fire is always with us. Water is another. It's very scarce. There is never enough for shaving. Out of necessity, the lost art of the manly beard is revived. And everywhere, beards flourish with tender care. The bathroom is another almost non-existent luxury. And even the shower is an infrequent luxury. Every drop of water must be gathered as snow and ice and melted. It's time consuming, expensive, and of course, this uses more precious fuel. Fuel that's essential for the small generators producing a trickle of electricity for radio communications, radar for aircraft control, and radar for scientific purposes. So, in another word, Antarctica has a power shortage. This is why plans and preparation went ahead for atomic power at McMurdo to give light for the six-month night, heat for the long winter, and electricity for daily jobs. McMurdo Sound, faced by a unique problem, now has a unique answer. One summery December day in 1961, 
The official Navy log of events carried big news in a routine entry. 14 December, RNF, escorted by ATCA and Eastwind, begins unloading at McMurdo Sound. The biggest American city on the seventh continent was about to become its first nuclear-powered town. And here it was, designed, built, tested, and delivered in a little more than a year. The Navy Seabees swarmed to work. Only 15 months earlier, under an Atomic Energy Commission contract for the development of a nuclear power plant for remote locations, the Martin Company's nuclear division had begun work. The new power plant was to be located on the site of Observation Hill overlooking McMurdo. And its foundations were to include preparation for a second and identical nuclear plant to be installed beside it. There's no scientific evidence that frozen rock is extra hard to work, but the sweating CBs would have been happier if it had been warmer as they got the foundations ready. PM3A is the official name of the plant. P for portable, M for medium, a medium power output of 1,500,000 watts. The plant was prefabricated in the United States in sections to ease the construction in the Antarctic. This kind of nuclear power plant can be shipped or even airlifted to remote sites simply because it was designed and built in portable parts to be assembled on the site. The plant itself is housed in two buildings. In the building on the left, in huge tanks, are the nuclear reactor and the equipment to generate steam. For safety, the reactor tanks are completely buried in a natural shield of crushed rock. This extraordinary little metal cylinder is the core of the reactor. It does the job of millions of gallons of diesel oil. The fissioning of atoms of uranium in the core produces heat, which turns water into steam. The steam is piped to the second building that houses the equipment to generate electricity. Safety, of course, has been uppermost in the design of the plant. Warning systems, monitoring devices, and control mechanisms underline safety. On top of all the safety features, the plant automatically monitors radiation and detects the approach of any unsafe level. A warning system is sounded well ahead of actual danger, and plant personnel can pinpoint and correct the situation at once. As a final act, the plant can be instantly shut down if necessary. Hand in hand with safety goes dependability. A dependability built into the system with the latest transistorized circuits and component parts which are easily replaced as units. In the cold of the frozen world of the south of us, the pioneering nuclear power plant has taken on a big job. Power for continent seven, power for heat, and power for elimination. Power for the ham radio operator to put through radio phone calls to homes in the States, the only contact with loved ones. Power aplenty to melt snow and ice into water aplenty. Power enough to prevent a shortage of fuel oil. Forty years have passed since seal hunters in wooden ships first sighted the shores of the seventh continent. And soon, because man in his ingenuity has learned to live and work in this inhospitable world, great airliners will whistle their way across the South Pole safely above the screaming blizzards far below. Will there one day be homes 
and schools and children in Antarctica? Will there be industry with its chambers of commerce, even tourists? It hardly seems possible. Yet, whatever form progress does take in this unfriendly land, nuclear power for heat, light, water, and electricity will be at hand to help. Thank you.